If you want to pump your body and expand your mind, there's only one place to go. Mind Pump. Mind Pump. With your hosts, Sal Stefano, Adam Schaefer, and Justin Andrews. We are here at uh, LAX recording this intro. We so had normally crazy... we would do a trip like this. We would get back and Doug would have to go through everything and probably Monday or Tuesday we'd record an intro, but we had so much fire this fucking weekend. We so have to get it out, We man. have to get it it's out. It's like we a burning sitting, hole in my pocket. We are sitting in the airport right now. Tons of people are staring at us. We look like a bunch of weirdos. Yeah. People are wondering we do why that we're anyway. I don't care. Wondering why we, we have headphones I, on I embrace and we're recording this uh, yeah. intro, but... We're gonna drop uh, Lewis House. What a great, uh, what a great interview. We're, you're t- very self-aware, very smart man, successful podcaster, successful businessman. Yeah. Wrote a new book, uh, The Masks of Masculinity. Excellent, excellent book. Definitely for men. Also, uh, excellent book for women. Talks about the different roles and the different masks that we wear as men to cover things up or to protect ourselves. And we ourselves. dive into it a little bit in this episode. So we touch on it, you know, towards yeah. the towards the end. But man, we went all over the place with Lewis. I love talking business with him. We got into personal, we got into insecurity. Got into health. his life and yeah. what oh, happened yeah. to him growing Great up. Great guy. He's successful for a reason. It's a, uh, and so his book is Massive Masculinity. His podcast is The School of Greatness. Uh, his website is lewishowes.com. That's L E W I S H O W E S. We'll actually l- link the book below too. So you guys will go direct link in the show notes. You can go right to it if you guys are interested in the book. So we'll have that all. Yeah, we'll have a link where you could grab that book. But anyway, without any further ado, uh, here we are talking to the great Lewis Howes. Spitfire. There's that crazy myth that has been perpetrated that says that the emotional self is separate from the physical self. It's all the same. It's all the human yeah. organism. And it's funny because science literally proves this. You know, yeah. we could see all the neurochemicals and hormones and stuff change from simple thoughts or feelings. Or emotions. Yeah, you or emotions. It's crazy that we would even separate the two and think that they're completely different. Right. Yeah. You know, it's insane. So, yeah. and you talked to Dr. Dr. Josh Axe, yeah. And you guys got to get him on and have him talk about this as well. But we were talking yesterday about how, you know, uh, even if you did everything right with your body and nutrition, you worked out, you slept right, you ate right, if your emotions were felt trapped, if you felt like you were a prisoner to your own heart, then you'd still get sick. You'd still have disease. You'd still have challenges. And so it really, I think it's combining like emotional health and physical health all in one if you want to have an optimal life. It's all, it's all part of it. It's funny too because when they do some of the best studies on longevity and health – come from uh, places in the world called Blue Zones. Yeah, exactly. These areas like, There's you know. one over here, I think, actually. Yeah, yeah. Loma Linda. Yeah, yeah. yeah the, the Seventh-day Adventists, uh-huh. I believe. Yeah. yeah. Um, and what they did when they did these studies is they said, okay, they thought they'd find some silver bullets. Like, oh, for sure everybody's going to eat. They're going to find this one food or this one. And it's they really the acai berry. They, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right, right. <laughs> they really didn't find that. But one thing they found that was consistent was these that they all had this kind of tight, nip, group uh, around family, them. community family yep. community whether it's religion or whether it's their you know their their significant other or their the, the you know the people around them in their town the grandparents were around whatever it was yeah yeah and it, they find that consistently that mm-hmm. consistently leads to not just a longer life but a healthier life yeah and especially in Europe too you know they're uh, Dr. Josh Ox was talking about how, you know, they don't eat that well. You know, the stuff they're eating is not as good, actually, as it should be. But they're happy because they're always together. They're always connected. And they, you know, they don't have these uh, uh, these sicknesses as much. Yeah, and we see this in fitness where, um, you know, the fitness industry, the, the, the industry that we work in, is so heavily focused on the, you know, macros yeah. and calories Constantly. and training that we see it's obsessive an, over it. Oh, absolutely. We, orthorexia. There's a term yeah. for it now, right? Orthorexia. What is that? Orthorexia is uh, like anorexia, except it's uh, like this obsession with eating perfectly. Think, of, think of all think of all your competitors, right? That compete. So, and we talk about this on the show. I I, uh, I competed for three years, and I did it first to just use it as a platform to catapult the the virtual business. So that was I never had this idea of wanting to get on a stage and compete. Never wanted. You to do always that. wanted to wear speed. Yeah, up. never once wanted to do that. But when I did it, <laughs> I'll tell you though. I, I remember coming back to these guys because we were already friends and we we're talking. And we were already working on Mind Pump. I said, dude, you guys are going to trip out because I went there. The idea was, okay, use that, use the uh, league in MPC IPB to as a platform, get your name out there, get a little bit of recognition. Then we'll use that to gather people and so listen to the show. And I come back and I'm telling these guys, holy shit, dude, you guys, I have seen. So I've between the three of us, we've trained thousands of of clients over all the years, and I saw more. 
uh, eating disorders, poor relations with poor relationships with food and exercise, and body dysmorphia in the competitive world mm-hmm. than I ever had seen in the thousands wow. of people that I trained, and that just blew my mind. I remember standing sitting backstage with this. Uh, at the amateur level and talking to all these guys and girls that were getting ready to compete and they were just kind of sharing their diet and their exercise and what they've been doing. I'm going like, what? What are you doing? Like, that's crazy. And that thought, well, you thought they're in like peak condition. Like, these are the top, top athletes, right? Well, when you look at like, when you go down, the, if anyone walks down a grocery aisle and you go to the magazine section, every single cover of a magazine is pretty much all my peers. It's yeah. all the women's bikini, all the men's physique and the bodybuilding guys are what are on the cover of magazines. And it's who are providing the information for the masses on how you should diet and exercise. Meanwhile, I'm backstage talking to all of them going, holy shit, these guys don't know what they're doing. <laughs> Not only do they know what they're doing, they have so much work they need to be doing on themselves of course. before they should even be in a position telling others. So super fascinated. Yeah. It's, a, it's yeah. Uh, you know, when I tell people that sometimes a glass of wine or a piece of cake or whatever can be very healthy, you, you, I mean, you should, you should see the looks on their faces, but if you understand that food can provide not just, you know, the physical uh, nourishment, right? Like, you know, there's nutrients and all that stuff that's that's good for the physical body. There's also the emotional health that can come from it, the spiritual health, the fact that we're sitting with friends and we're connecting mm-hmm. over a glass of wine and we're enjoying each other's company. Well, that can be very healthy as well. And that's how you develop that that good relationship with these types of Absolutely. things. So yeah. very, very fascinating uh, yeah. a topic. Yeah, yeah, we love talking about that. So, uh, so Mr. House, how did you get started in this Mr. world? Yeah. <laughs> how did you get tell me about yourself? How did you get started in this world of podcasting? And, yeah, you know, kind of what you do now. Like, what brought you here? It's funny because ten years ago, I retired playing professional football. I mean, I didn't play in the NFL, so I called professional because I got paid two hundred fifty dollars a week to play and beat myself against Boom. the wall. <laughs> yeah. um, and my, when that was over, I was devastated because my entire identity was wrapped around being an athlete. And so when I couldn't be an athlete, I was like, well, who am I? This is what I've always got my worth from, my value from in, from my peers is being like this great athlete. And so when it was over, I was on, uh, you know, my dad had just gone through a, a really bad accident where he, he got in a car accident and the car came on top of his car and the bumper hit him in the head. Oh, shit. He was in New Zealand wow. and they had to cut the car in half, airlift him out into a hospital. And for three months, he was in a coma. <laughs> So during this time, I didn't know, we didn't know if he was going to make it or not. We were just like, had no clue because the swelling was so bad in his brain that we didn't know if he was going to come out of it on the other side. He eventually woke up, um, got back to the U.S., but it was kind of like my dad died that day when he got home. Like, he didn't really recognize me. Mm. You know, he, he couldn't speak. He couldn't. He just wasn't himself. Now, were you this close is 10 to, years ago? 10 years ago. Now, were you close to him? Did you identify very close. strongly with yeah, him? Yeah, very close. This is about actually 12 This is about twelve years ago. My dad, 10 years ago, where I got in this, this uh, I got done playing football. Um, very close with him. He was kind of like, you, you know, the first, it's funny, the first half of my life till I was 13, I was terrified of him. <clears throat> like, he was like this angry kind of, uh, just wasn't ever fully happy with himself. I think he... You know, he and my mom got uh, married early when they were like 18 and they had their first kid. And then they had three more. So there's four of us. And he had to work three jobs right away just to kind of provide. So I think he never got to do what he wanted to do in his life, like his dreams. And so I think he was just kind of resentful always. And it was very stressful. God, how many people are like that, though? Yeah, a lot of people, right? right? But he stayed, you know, they stayed married when they shouldn't have. They finally got divorced. But it was just kind of like dealing with this passive aggressive energy every day when, when they would come home and, you know, it just wasn't fun. So when I, when I turned 13 though, he started to finally kind of make more money in his business. He did life insurance. He started to finally make more money. And all of a sudden, like, it was like a new person. He and my mom had gotten divorced and they were both fully happy. It seemed like, and I was mm-hmm. like, wow, okay. Um, he was making more money and then he was like the best dad ever. He was at every game. He was at everything like fully supportive, always happy, always giving like super compassionate. And he said, you know, I want you to make sure you always go for your dreams. And if it doesn't work out, you can come back and work with me, you know, kind of like the family business type of thing. So I always had in the back of my mind, like if it doesn't work out, my dad's got You're my going back. There. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like he's going to give me the business, you know, one day, like he'll teach me and then that'll be that. So you have a parachute now. Yeah. yeah. I kind of had like a, you know, a landing pad or whatever. And so when he got in his accident, I was like, Oh shoot, what do I do now? 
I, I went to go continue to pursue my dream of playing football. Then I got injured. And at that time, he was kind of recovering. We, were, we had to teach him how to write, how to talk, how to, you know, read again, how to just like, you know, we had to clean him, everything. You know, I had to help him go to the bathroom. And so for me, as like a 23-year-old, this was very challenging to see my father in this position. Well, I bet. And for him to, when he was able to talk, it was like, tell me again what you did. You know, when you were 16, like, tell me, he always had, he, he couldn't remember. Right. And still today, it's kind of like a broken record. He's like, didn't you used to play football? <clears throat> so we can have a conversation, but it's just not fully what it used to be. Mm -hmm. And um, so when that happened, you know, I got injured. He was recovering, but he wasn't really emotionally there for me. I didn't have like his backup plan. He had to sell his business to his business partner based on their, their buyout clause. Because mm. if someone got injured, then that's, that was what was happening. So I didn't have access to that, which is, I really didn't want to do anyways. Right. So now I'm on my sister's couch for a year and a half trying to figure out, cause I had a surgery. I broke my wrist, I had a surgery and uh, they took a bone out of my hip, put it in my wrist. So I was in a cast from here to here for six months. And then it took another year to just recover. So I'm on my sister's couch for a year and a half because I didn't have any money. I didn't have a backup job. I didn't have anything. And I'm recovering. During this time, a mentor said, why don't you check out LinkedIn? Maybe you can find some job opportunities there. So I get on LinkedIn for about six hours a day, and I'm just emailing people, influential people in Columbus, Ohio, where I'm living, uh, reaching out to people mm -hmm. to try to build these relationships and ask them for advice. No one's getting back to me when I say, I, le I need some advice. I need some help. <laughs> so I'm like, huh, why aren't these people getting back to me? <laughs> Let me optimize my profile so I look more credible and then try to approach them in a different way. Mm. And so I optimized my profile to make it look like I had some results or something playing arena football. I start emailing people in a different way. And all of a sudden, everyone replies to me. Anyone from like top CEOs to millionaires to leaders in the community mm. to big names in the industry, everyone's replying to me. And I'm like, huh. You got to talk about perception. You, there, you, huh? you, yeah, you have to share in depth about that because yeah, feel, what, what, we get a lot that? of questions, I feel yeah. like, uh, with yeah. people that are wanting to build a business around yeah. social media and they don't yeah, realize look like? the importance of this piece right here. Yeah. Um, so I started to just think about what would I want if I was in that position? If someone was reaching out to me, what would I, what would I reply to? What would get your attention? Yeah. What would get my attention? And right away I was just like, you know what? They kind of feel like they, you know, I didn't really read like the business books or anything like that, but I was just like, we've got to have mutual things in common. So I started reviewing their LinkedIn profile and seeing everything they would talk about. And then I would go research them in depth, anything I could find, I would research them. And I would see how we're connected through mutual friends right off the bat. So I would reach out to someone and say, you know, I saw that we're connected to Jeff and Sally, and I just talked to Jeff about you last week. That'd be like the first thing. Mm. Then I'd be like, I saw you grew up in, I went to Ohio State University, and uh, I'm a big Ohio State football fan. And then I would say one more thing. Well, there's an in right there. I'd say, <laughs> right, right, exactly. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, then I would say one more thing. I'd find three things to connect on that we had like mutual connection. And, and if you have at least one mutual friend, then it always was more valuable. And then I would never ask them for anything. So I'd lead with like the three layers of mutual commonality, right? Now, when you're doing this, yeah. are you are you like putting this formula together? Did you read it no, somewhere? No, I had no idea. No idea what you No doing. idea. I was yeah. just kind of like, trying to figure we, it out. Well, first I was like, oh, let me just make like, I was building my audience on LinkedIn, so I had all these like secondary connections mm. to these bigger names. So I was just like, hey, I know that we're both connected to so and so. And then, you know, sometimes that would work, sometimes it wouldn't. And they'd be like, I know we're both connected to so and so, and I see you played college football. So did I. I played in the Arena League. And sometimes that worked, sometimes not. So I was like, okay, let me just add more things to it. Yeah. I see that you were like a sports management uh, major. I see that you were this. I see whatever I could do to relate to them. Mm. I would try to put that out there. And I found it like if you find three things, then that's pretty, it was kind of like the formula for me. Right. Hmm. And, um, and then I would do something else that most people never do, which I would never ask for advice, I would never ask for help, never ask for an introduction. I would make it all about them and find something specific that they had done in their career, whether it be like a jump in their career, something where they accomplished something based on their LinkedIn profile. And I'd say, I'm so fascinated by how you went from uh, a marketing person to the COO. And I'd love to learn that story. <clears throat> Would you mind sharing your story of success and making that happen with mm. me? 
Now, when you're asking that question, are you thinking podcast? Yeah, yeah I was going to say. No, no, no. This is 10 like years podcast. ago still. This so is still 10 years ago. Okay, so this is still just- I didn't even know what a podcast was. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. <laughs> but I was just like, here's what happened. I started getting all these people, these leaders in Columbus, Ohio, who were like, yeah, I'll give you 10 minutes. Like, let's join, a, let's meet up for coffee or, or breakfast or lunch. So all these people were meeting with me. Before, they wouldn't meet with me at all when I would ask for advice or ask for help. Or can I have 10 minutes of your time? And pick your brain. How often do you guys get that? Mm-hmm. And um, when I said, like, I'm just fascinated by your story. I want to hear your story of how you did this. They were like, yes. I think everyone wants to share their story. Right. And so I was meeting with these individuals in person. And now this is when I was broke. So I couldn't afford lunch already. <laughs> and they would pay for my breakfast or lunch already, which was like amazing. They were like, let me get it. This like, is, you're thanks, the- kid, for calling me for exactly. lunch. <laughs> but they were like, you're actually doing me a favor, like, for allowing me to share my story. Oh, uh. Yeah, they're like, I insist. And I was like, you sure? I can take it. But I was like, I don't have any money. So I was like, thank you. And um, and I was like, wow, I'm building some unbelievable relationships. And at the end of all these meetings, people were like, what can I do for you? And I would never ask for anything. I was like, I just want to help you. And I want to figure out what your biggest challenge is right now. And they'd be like, well, I need a new person in sales. I need a new marketing person. I don't understand this like LinkedIn thing, how you've done it. Can you help me there? And so I was just trying to solve people's biggest problems, whether they needed investment, they needed a connection, whatever it was, I was just trying to be the matchmaker. And that was what kind of helped me initially. But in these conversations, I was like, man, these are fascinating what they're sharing with me about their story. And I was like, I wish my peers could could hear this because I'm getting some unbelievable information. Now, I didn't know five years later. So that was five years later when I started the podcast. Wow. So I was just doing this for myself. And I started building my own business through first LinkedIn course and a book that I wrote. And I started doing LinkedIn networking events around the country. Wow. Yeah. So I did 20 networking events where I And this is early on. Like LinkedIn's 2008. Only, yeah. LinkedIn's 2008. just really starting to rock and roll. Right? 2008. I think there was like 20 million people on 16 to 20 million people when I was, when I was getting on. And, um, so this was around the time when Twitter was kind of blowing up and people were doing tweet ups. I don't know if you remember this back in 2008, mm. Twitter meetups. Oh, okay. Uh, so I would go, they were called tweet ups. Tweet ups. He's, he's like, yes. Yeah. <laughs> so I would go to these tweet ups and I was like, this is fascinating. Like there's 300 people here and they just met up from like just sharing it on a Twitter. And I go, there's a real need in 2008. There was a big need for, uh, the economy was in a bad place. I don't know if you guys remember this mm-hmm. economy hit a, had a, took a big hit. People with masters weren't getting jobs. Right. Now I didn't even graduate college yet at this point. And I said, there's a need here. I'm going to bring people together that I'm connecting with on LinkedIn because they're all looking for more leads. They're looking for jobs. I'm going to bring them together. So I did my first event. 350 people showed up. Wow. And I was 24. I had like one suit jacket. I tried to show up like looking professional and everyone else is like in their 30s and 40s. And I was like, "Who? what am I doing? I have no clue what I'm doing. But I acted like I had done an event and just like greeted everyone and shook everyone's hand who came there. 350? 350 first people. Event. Now yeah, you're charging sure. for this? People are paying That's to impressive. attend this? first one I just did free because I was like, I don't know if people are going to show up. Yeah, sure. But I got four table sponsors to pay 250 each. So I made $1,000 from like the sponsorships. And then I was like, huh, I wonder <laughs> if I charge at the door if people would show up. And so the next one I charged $5. And I was like, oh, I don't know if people are going to show up. More people showed up. Mm-hmm. And they were more qualified, right? What a great what a great lesson that is right there. Right? Yeah. And then I was like, oh man, I wonder if I charge ten dollars, but they still show up. So I charge ten. I charge fifteen, twenty. And then I was like, okay, I've got the sponsorship, I've got the door commission. I wonder I'm building these relationships with these kind of restaurants and bars where I was hosting them. Uh-huh. And I was I would reach out to them and I'd say, What's the, the deadest night for you? Like, what's that? And it's like a Tuesday or Wednesday night. And I go, okay, I'm going to bring 300 or 400 people. Oh, they love you for that. Love me, right? right. And they're going to buy drinks and food. And I go, can I get a commission from the food and and bar? Can I get 10%? And they're like, yeah, if you bring in this much money, we'll give you 10%. And then I was like, okay. I did that a few times and I get an extra few grand. And I was like, can I get 15%? (laughs) I just kept asking (laughs) for more. Yeah. Yeah. Like, I'm going to bring you this. You're not going to have it. You're going to, I'm going to go take it next door. It's a win win. Win win. And then I was like, people started asking me for like consulting on LinkedIn. So I started doing a one-on-one teaching them. They were like, how are you doing this? I'm like all through LinkedIn. And then I met a guy who helped me write a LinkedIn book. He was like, you need to kind of scale this message. Otherwise you're doing one-on-one forever. So I wrote a book and I'd sell those books at my events. And so I was figuring out every way I could monetize one event. 
to wow. one platform. What, now, what do, what do these look like? So you are you standing up and you're just talking to everybody how to utilize these tools? What are you I teaching? Was, I was just bringing people together. I wouldn't even talk at all. What? Wow. I would so make, they were just, everyone just, just like networking? <laughs> it, was just networking. it was just a networking event. Oh, and I, wow. I would have like a, you know. Even better. I had like kind of booths set up with like little tables like this where people would like put some of their products or whatever, like services. So it would be like five to seven booths per event eventually. And then I would make like an announcement for five minutes. Like, hey, make sure you guys are like tipping the bartender. Make sure you're this. Make sure you're this. Like dropping your business card. I was just like building my own email list at the time through business cards. And I still was just like, I just needed to make some money because I was on my sister's couch. Now, at at this point in your life, because you're only like, what, 23, 24 24 years old. Do you recognize kind of the brilliance in what you're doing right now? Are you just... When people told me, they were like, this is fascinating. They're like, how are you doing this through LinkedIn? And I realized like, wow, there's a real need here. No one's really talking about this one platform. They're all talking about Twitter and other stuff at the time. So I said, I'm going to be the LinkedIn guy. Like, I'm just going to go all in and be the expert on how to use LinkedIn because no one else was doing this. So funny we're talking about this because literally in the car on the way over here, I was talking about LinkedIn. Really? Yeah, I just just finished the book, The Four, which was an incredible book if you haven't read that book. Mm -hmm. Uh, And it's Amazon, Google, Facebook, and um, LinkedIn or... And Apple. Apple. Thank oh, you, wow. Doug. Thank you, Doug. The, the big four. And they're talking about they're the big four, four, four horsemen who could be the potential fifth one. They get into Microsoft in there and they talk about how uh, Microsoft 10 years ago was so huge and then they've pivoted to like a consulting and then they bought LinkedIn. Yeah. So I'm super fascinated yeah. in, in the direction they're going. Do you still Are you still paying a lot of attention? In the Here's the thing. I was like literally on there all day long, 24-7 for years and mm-hmm. I just got kind of burnt out. <laughs> I was awesome so now. bored yeah. of talking about like how to add your like bio and your profile picture and I was just like, I'm over this. Right. So I haven't even used LinkedIn in years. I mean, we have, we'll like post our content up there in the newsfeed or whatever. Cause I've got a huge audience there Yeah, and I've got these massive groups that I haven't even tapped into in years. Cause I've just been, it's just not fun for me. That's anymore. awesome. Now, is though. that what got yeah. you to pivot out of that into podcasting? Were you just bored and you're like, I, was, I gotta do something so different. I, so I started with LinkedIn and then I created, I, I created my first course. This is how I got into online marketing. I did my first training course on LinkedIn. It was like a hundred dollar course teaching people how to use LinkedIn video training. And I made $6,200 in my first webinar teaching this. And I didn't have the course done yet. So I said, hey, buy this and you'll get it in a couple weeks. And I made <laughs> get it when I finish it. <laughs> and it was like a, it was like a janky. I didn't, want to, I didn't yeah. want to make a sales page. I didn't know how to do anything. So I just said, like, here's a janky PayPal link. Like, type this in. It was like 27 characters, you know, pound, star, seven, six, you know, slash whatever. And... Um, I was like, go here and then trust me that you'll get something in a couple weeks, essentially. <laughs> wow. And I made $6,200 and it was like, it opened my mind to like, it would blew my, my world. Yeah. I was like, wow, I've been scrapping around doing these events around the country for a year, making three to four grand, you know, uh, an event, but like really hustling to get people there right. and like manage it and showing awesome. it. It's like, I was like, I'm burnt out from these events. Um, that to make sixty two hundred dollars in an hour, I was like, "This is my life." Like, <laughs> Here we go. I'm going to figure out whatever it is to like master what a webinar is, like how to optimize this. And I was like, "I will do it every day for the rest of my life if it's going to make me this type of money." Because at this time, I'm paying two hundred fifty dollars a month to live at my brother's house because my sister, after a year and a half, got like pissed off that I wasn't like giving anything or contributing anything. She was like, "You either need to get a job and start paying, or you need to get out." So I was like, all right, let me go to my brother now and ask him if I can stay for free. And, he made, and his wife made me two, pay two fifty a month. Um, and that's when I made this this money at their place. And I was like, okay, time to go get my own apartment. I found an apartment for four ninety five a month, and I was terrified to pay it. I was like, I don't think I'm going to be able to do this yeah. for months. And I was like, but leveling up made me like level up my mindset as well. Usually does and take, that. and take action, right? And, um, and so I started on this LinkedIn course and I was like, okay, let me optimize this LinkedIn course, this video training course and figure out this webinar thing. And I did that. And then that did really well. And people were like, okay, you've taught me LinkedIn. Can you teach me how to use Facebook? Can you teach me how to use Twitter? Can you teach me YouTube? So I started creating these other programs because it's what the people wanted. And I found experts to teach them, the top people. And I was like, okay, we're going to create a product Mm -hmm. around you. We're going to create a publishing model. And, um, and that kind of blew up there. And so I got that business to a two and a half million dollar a year business within the next two years. Wow. 
after I and like, how old are you now? You're at I'm like 26, 27, maybe. Yeah. Wow. And I had a business partner at the time, so I was splitting everything. Uh, and I just had no clue where they, what I was doing in business. I was never taught any of this stuff. I was just like, all right, I'm going to do webinars. I'm going to build relationships. I'm going to teach and I'm going to sell. Where did, where did all the self-belief come from? I think it came from a couple, of, a couple of things. Sports was a big uh, factor for me because I was just, you know, you, you guys played sports, right? So for me, it's just like the Justin and I do. Sal, Sal has two yeah. left feet. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the mindset of just, you know, playing sports at a high level with the pressure constantly, right. you know, really developed me. I feel like gave me that edge. So I always believed. And the, the what my dad taught me just really – encouraged the belief in myself. Do you think there was a party that was driven because of that and because of what happened to him? And I not- think, I don't think I'd be here. I don't think any of this would be happening if he didn't get in his accident, to really? be honest. Hmm. Yeah. And I actually don't talk about it that much. Um, but I think it was supposed to happen hmm. for me to be able to do what I'm doing. That may sound a little egotistical, but I truly believe there was the night before he left for his trip to New Zealand. He'd never missed a game, a football game. He would fly all over the country for me, no matter what. Mm-hmm. And he was going to miss one game my senior year. And I was like, why are you missing this game? I had a bye week, so he was going to miss that, which was fine. But then the next week he was going to miss because he was going to be gone for two weeks in New Zealand with his new fiance. And I was like, why are you missing this? He goes, I feel like I need to go on a spiritual journey. And it was like, gives me chills thinking about it because he was like, I, I, you know, I just really want to go on a spiritual journey and I want to go to, I've never been to New Zealand. I really want to go there. Wow. The, what a trip. This is what he's saying to you before he's wow. saying to me the night before he leaves. Fuck. And we're at a, a family camp. We would go to this like YMCA family camp, um, either Memorial day or Labor day weekend. We would go for three days as the whole family. And he's sitting by himself on the couch. I don't know if I even shared this, but he's sitting by himself on the couch in like the, the mess hall area. And I just see him looking weird. He's like looking out at everything, just kind of weird. And so I go sit by him because he's just kind of looking like, I don't know, something's going on. I go talk to him. I go, you know, what's going on? You excited about the trip? Why are you leaving? And he's like, are you angry right now? Are you kind of bitter as a no, kid? I'm like, just, wait, no, because I'm, well, I'm kind of like, you know, I had transferred to come back to Ohio my senior year so I could be closer to him. So he didn't have to travel as much. Mm-hmm. So I went to a school closer to him because I was always gone uh, from Ohio. So I was kind of like, man, you know, my first week I was like broke school records. Uh, I was like, you know, all conference. And then the second week he was leaving and I was like, why are you leaving? This is like senior year. Like, let's do this together, you know? (laughs) And he was like, I just feel like I need to go on a spiritual journey. And it was just weird the way he said it. It was just very weird. And, um, and so the, the game he missed the night before, I got a call at 11.30 at night from my sister. I see it on my cell phone come up. And right away, I'm like, something happened. Because my family knows not to call me like that late the mm-hmm. night before Especially a game. Especially the day before. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. So I pick it up and I go, what happened to dad? And she's just like, she can't even speak. She's yeah, like in tears, right? Yeah. And I just had a feeling. I was like, otherwise, nothing would be wrong, you know? And she t- said the story, you know, he got an accident. We don't even know if he's alive right now. He's getting airlifted. We have limited communication. Like, and so I'm like, what do I do? Do I play tomorrow? Do I not? Like, and my brother was like, you got to play because we just, we have no clue what he's going to, what's happening, but right. he would want you to play. So you might as well play. So I did. And the second to last play of the game, I break three ribs and then we lose the game in the next play. Mm. And so I, <laughs> At the end of the game, I am walking off like hobbled, broken three ribs. We lose. And I'm like, is dad alive or dead? I'm like, I don't even know. Wow. You know, I'm like, we don't even know. And so yeah. it's it's yeah, fascinating powerful. that moments like this, the most challenging moments of our lives are the ones that propel us yeah. into yeah. you know what we're supposed to do. Yeah. And so I, I believe that like because I didn't have the backup plan anymore to go work with him, because I didn't have his emotional support, his mentorship. Like, I didn't have any of that. None of it was there. Like, he couldn't communicate. He couldn't give me advice. He couldn't support me. It's almost like he didn't care anymore, right? God, and at that time, he's probably, at that age, where you're at in your life, he's probably at least one of the top, if not the top mentor probably Absolutely. No, he's brilliant. He's a brilliant man. Wow. Yeah, he's brilliant. And uh, so for me, I was like, okay, I got to figure this out. I got to find other mentors. I got to, I can't let this be my excuse and just like sit here in Ohio and just be miserable on my sister's couch for 
a longer time, like I've got to step up now. Dude, where does this awareness come from? That level of awareness at that age. I think I always, when I was five, I knew that uh, I just had big dreams. I was just like, I'm here for a reason. You had a purpose. Yeah, I just knew when I was five. I was just like, something magical is going to happen because I was in so much pain and insecurity growing up mm. that um, I just felt like that uh, my sensitiveness was really like a, a superpower. Mm. And, um, but it, it wasn't at the time because I didn't have any friends growing up, but I felt like someday this is gonna, this is gonna matter. It's gonna mean something. And so, yeah. Did you feel like you didn't fit in growing up? Absolutely. I didn't have any friends. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I was like the tall, gangly, goofy kid. I was picked last in sports teams. I was made fun of a lot. I was in the special needs classes. I couldn't read out loud. So the teachers, I don't know if this ever happened to you guys, but they would like have us read aloud in class. Mm -hmm. And it would come to me and I would just stutter and stumble and just stop and sit down because I couldn't do it. So, yeah, I just knew that though. I just knew that I had to figure something out. Like this wasn't what my life was supposed to be. Right. I wasn't supposed to like not make it to the NFL and like get injured and be done. And now what? Yeah. Like go work a job that I don't love. Did you just be miserable? Was that your ultimate vision was to get into the NFL? Yeah. Yeah. yeah it was like your yeah, dreams as a kid. The Olympics in the NFL. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I wanted to, I wanted to be an Olympian and I'm still pursuing that actually, which sounds kind of crazy. Oh, oh shit. What? I play what? with the, I play with the USA handball team right now. Oh, oh, good deal. So I'm on the Olympic team. No way. We just didn't qualify Did the last two Olympics. About you? Yeah. yeah, I didn't know. That's awesome. If, here's the thing. If the Olympics were hosted in the U.S., I'd be an Olympian because it's an automatic qualifier. Oh, shit. The host country is an automatic qualifier for every sport. So you just have to – they only take one country from North and South America for team handball. Oh, and wow. uh, you've got to win that tournament in order to go. And how, how the fuck do you get into team handball? Yeah. You're just like yeah, from you, football you to team handball? I mean – 2008, again, the same time 10 years ago. I uh, was on my sister's couch and I watched the Olympics. I was watching during when I, had, I just got the cast off. And you're like, that handball looks fucking <laughs> I saw handball for the first time. I'd never seen it before. It was like 3 a.m. Oh, wow. And I watched these highlights and I was like, what is this sport? Like, What's going on? I was on like, here? this yeah. is my sport. <laughs> oh, wow. And so I started obsessively researching. I was like, this is my chance to make it to the Olympics if I can't make it to the NFL. Oh, wow. Mm. And then I researched like handball clubs in Ohio and Columbus. There was nothing. And then, as I say, how do you even practice and get good at that? Like, yeah, exactly. So there's there's club. It's an amateur sport in the U.S. Okay. This is handball where it's like water polo on a basketball court. This is not a handball where you hit a ball against the wall. Oh, that's what yeah, I'm. That's what I'm right. thinking. That's what I'm picturing right now. So describe this. For this is a, do you know what I'm talking about or no? No, I'm, I'm. Team handball is imagine water polo. Okay. Without water. Okay. Where there's two teams. Throwing a ball. Oh, that's kind of cool. Dribbling, and it's on a bigger basketball oh, that's court. That's way cool. And it's like a, a small soccer goal where you're throwing it behind a goalie. So imagine soccer with your hands. Okay. Mm -hmm. On a smaller field. Oh, wow. You're dribbling, you're passing, and, but it's Can very aggressive. you tackle aggressive. people? You can't fully tackle them, but like, you can like hit field oh, I was hard. almost like in. field hockey kind of, right? Kind of like lacrosse yeah. with, your, with your arms, yeah. Right. And uh, it's fascinating. It's unbelievable. It's one of the fastest sports in the world. Uh, it's huge in Europe. You know, 20,000 people come out to watch these games. It's like, it's unbelievable. And so I moved to New York City two years later. I said, when I make enough money, I'm going to go to New York City because that's where the national champions were for handball in the U.S. After I did all this research, I found like, okay, New York City is the place to be if I want to learn this. Two years later, when I made this money, I moved to New York City, walk into practice and say, I'm going to be an Olympian. I'm going to make the USA team. And they all laughed at me. I'm the only American. It's all Europeans that have moved to New York for other reasons. And you've never point. really played this sport. Never played in my life. <laughs> I said, I'm going to make the USA national team. I'm going to the Olympics. They laughed at me. They wouldn't even speak Did they to, they wouldn't even speak the to me. Yeah. They wouldn't even speak to me in English. They would just speak in their other languages. <laughs> right. Right. Probably mock me. Making fun of me. <laughs> yeah. But I showed up every single practice for that year. And nine months later, I made the USA national team and started competing against Olympic teams in Brazil and Argentina and, and South America with the USA team. And this is a seven and a half years ago now, seven years ago. And, um, I can't remember where we're at in the first place, but did I, did I think I'd be doing this when my dad went through all these things? I was just like, I, I believe that there was just more for my life than what I was doing. Yeah. I just believe like I had an opportunity to, to find a meaning of why all these things happened and make the most of it for the gifts and talents that I have and figure it out. And so I kind of had that that vision, you know, 
eight, 10 years ago. Well, this kind of leads me to two to talk about your, the, your newest book right now. And you talk about how different mass kind of the same way that I talk about our greatest strength is your greatest weakness. Yeah. So I say that a lot on our show yeah. and you kind of talk the same way. And also your greatest weakness is your greatest strength. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. So it's uh, inverse, right. Related. And I think that uh, the way you talk about the mass are very similar. And that could be a situation right there where is an example in your life where you're looking to play this sport. These guys aren't talking to you. I'm sure that the mask, your athletic mask yeah, that course. you probably wore, it was also what drove you to be so great at it. Right. Can you expand on uh, that a little bit? Yeah, the athlete mask is a powerful one because it. it when I was in third grade, I uh, got picked last on a on a on a, on a team. Oh, Sal can relate to this. <laughs> I, I, yeah. So I uh, so the the teacher said, okay, we're gonna go out to recess uh, and we're gonna play like a a class game where we're going to play dodgeball. And he picked two people to be like the captains to pick the teams. And he's like, okay, you get to pick one person at a time and you trade off. The stuff that you can't do in school anymore, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, 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 But but probably built great character in your now. now. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) And so there was like the two popular guys that he had like pick. And I'm thinking I'm one of the tallest. I'm pretty athletic. Right. They're going to pick me first. Shoe in. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I'm I'm in. Yeah. So I'm kind of like standing close to them. Like they're going to pick me, you know, and they start picking one by one all these other boys in the class. There's probably, I don't know, 40 kids in the class, 20-ish boys or something. And so they're picking all these guys until it comes down to me and, like, literally the guy with two left feet, right? <laughs> the nerdy-looking like guy. Get dead to Sal. Right, right. <laughs> it's you or Sal right teaser, now. Teaser. <laughs> the guy with, like, the glasses, like, the, the skinny, like, kid who is, like, a little, you Looks know. Looks like he's never seen a ball in his exactly, life before. Exactly, who right. can barely walk, right? right? And I'm like, there's no way they're going to pick this kid. It's no chance. Like, I'm a good athlete, right? That's what I thought to myself. And then they pick this kid, and he starts, like, walking over to the team. And I'm like, seriously, I'm the last boy picked? But then something interesting happens. They pick a girl before me. Mm. And I'm like, what? Like, instantly, (laughs) like, I felt, like, so humiliated that there was a girl picked before me. Then they pick another girl and another until it's all come down to me and one girl left. Wow. Now, this girl is like, can't even walk times, you know, a million, right? This is even worse than the, like, the nerdy guy. Yeah. And they pick her before me. And so now I'm the last. And then they don't only pick me. Just because I'm, like, the last one on the last team, they're like, okay, Mm -hmm. well, you go over there. Yeah. Like, didn't even pick you. You had to go there. You just had to, right? And so, again, as, like, a third grader, I'm thinking to myself, I'm humiliated. Like, this is, I'm less than a boy. I'm less than a girl. Like, what am I? Right. And I'll tell you what, I was like dominating in this game. I took all this anger and was like slamming in each other's faces. I was like catching everything. I was like, I'm going to prove you guys wrong, right? Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. And um, I continued with that anger for many years. Yeah. I said, I'm going to prove you guys wrong. Mm. And I was training like a machine after school. Every day, I was like, I'm never going to get picked last again. Oh, that's deep the, roots, huh? Oh, I was like, I'm going to be the most dominant athlete I can be. I'm going to get mm. so big, so fast, so strong that people have to pick me first. And that's what I did. And it worked. The mask of the athlete mask worked for and me. And that's why it's so difficult. Yeah. That's it's why so it's so tough to yeah. take off. So challenging because it, it drove me to be all state in multiple sports, all American, you know, get play pro football. It drove me to achieve. And I, I got a lot of value from that. You know, I learned a lot of great things. People accepted me. They wanted to be around me. I had friendships now because I was like accepted in the, the, the group. I wasn't just like the awkward kid anymore. And the challenge is when I come from a place of needing to win at all costs, needing to be right at all costs, at all times, not just on the sports field, but in life, it's very, it's a lonely place. And, uh, you know, I was always competitive in everything with my girlfriends and just like a little game of like flip cup or something, you know, whatever, just like heads and tails or like thumb war. It's like, I had to dominate. Yeah. And people are like, God, you're so aggressive. Like take this so serious. Yeah. Why is it so serious? Why can't we just have have fun? Like girlfriends would be like, gosh, this is like, you're not fun to be around. (laughs) You're not fun to play sports with at all. Right. It's like, but I had to win at everything at all costs, no matter what. Well, it's tough because when you when you've learned to switch that on and you become ultra competitive and then you have success with it and you have repeat success with it and you get rewarded and you get all these things acknowledged people like make you money. because of it and all Absolutely. that stuff and it, until you're forced until exactly. you're forced to yeah. take that as you would say mask exactly off. exactly and the, the the 
the rewards were high, but so were the prices I paid. Mm. The price in like feeling alone, loneliness, feeling like it was never enough. Like even though I'd win at all these things or I would achieve at all these things, it was like, how come I didn't feel good still? How come like it wasn't fulfilling me? How come I wasn't satisfied? And it was just never enough because I was still trying to prove people wrong in my competition. I was still trying to prove like my worth to people as opposed to just owning it and not trying to make people wrong for what they think about me, but lifting others up and then trying to do it for inspiration. Now, do you think through trying to prove other people wrong that, or prove your worth that in reality you were trying to prove your worth to yourself? Absolutely. I mean, to everyone and myself, you know. Yeah. The world. Now you talk about that's one of the masks one of, of, masks, of, yeah. of masculinity that you identify. There's nine, I believe, mm-hmm. that you said that mm-hmm. are in there. Do you feel that masculinity is at a crossroads right now? Do you feel like there's a bit of a crisis? I think so. We were talking about this before. You know, everything we see in the media every every day, it seems like, is there's one common thing that we see. And starting back six months ago, just this year alone, you know, we see Charlottesville. We see men marching angry. We see all the political dis-ease that's happening, just the constant conflict that's happening. A lot of anger. We see a lot of sexual abuse and harassment happening in Hollywood right now. And just with like Uber and NPR and all these executives and companies, Mm -hmm. Amazon, we see Every three days, it seems like a new shooting, a new killing from Vegas, just like unleashing anger into the world to when I was in New York City a few weeks ago, the guy who just drove through New York City and killed a bunch of people uh, in the van or the truck to the church last week where Mm -hmm. the guy went to the church to up in Northern California, I think a couple of days ago, whatever happened up there. I mean, it just seems like every day there's something happening where um, the common denominator is a man that doesn't know how to express himself in healthier forms. A man that feels like I need to be uh, wear the sexual mask. The, the all I mean, every year we see athletes who are beating their wives, or you know, domestic violence, or something like that, where they're just punching them in a elevator and watching the door slam on them. There's all these different masks that we see in the media that men are wearing, and the conditioning is hard to break from what happened when you were a kid to your teen years when these things are rewarded for us, you know, when these things are rewarding, it's hard to break it and turn off the switch and say, well, I'm going to express myself and communicate from a loving way or just open up and have a conversation as opposed to that's not acceptable. Sometimes it's not acceptable to to open up and express ourselves that way. We get made fun of as guys, we get ridiculed, we get pushed away. So we say, fuck it. I'm just going to be angry. Then if you want me to talk this way, then let's go. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Let's fight. Let's do this. I'm going to dominate. I'm going to win. And um, it's hurting our humanity, I believe. I, I, I think what we're, a lot of what we're seeing is, uh, you know, for millennia, men have felt like they've had uh, an important role or important place in society. And as society's evolved and grown, mm-hmm. you know, we're sitting here thinking, well, what do I do now? Like, you know, they don't yeah. need me to protect them because right. they make it's money. pretty yeah. safe. They don't need me to make money. What is our role? Uh, yeah. Yeah. You know, um, school is, you know, punishing, you know, to boys because we're, we tend to be more rambunctious. Mm-hmm. So we're not really doing well there. And statistics show that girls do a lot better yeah. in school. Um, I can't show vulnerability. I can't show emotion. Because I made fun of by my peers or my dad will hit me. That's or right. Doesn't that's, know how to communicate with me. Or. That's right. It's interesting. I watched this uh, very fascinating video on um, how men make up a majority or a large percentage of both ends of the spectrum where you have a majority of people in prison, a majority yeah. of people with mental illness, a majority of you know suicides. all the issues are, are suicides are men. And then on the other end, inventors and you know artists and creators it's almost as if the male gender if you will or sex or whatever was evolved to be that kind of outsider but with modern society it's can be quite frustrating yeah. and so i think it's perfect timing yeah right? something like this mm-hmm. could could you would you mind going into some of the other masks well you before, talked about the- no before you go into all the masks mm-hmm. i want to know personally with yep. you because i know you and you express this uh, i've heard you talk about it that we all have multiple masks. Mm-hmm. Would you say that the athlete one in you is the deepest rooted one, or yeah. do you have another? The that- athlete and the aggressive are the deepest, probably, because, you know, I talk about this openly, but I was raped when I was five by a man. 
And my brother went to prison when I was eight till I was 12 and a half for four and a half years. And so during that time, I didn't have friends because the neighborhood, you know, I was grew up in like a middle class white suburban neighborhood. So to have someone in your family go to prison Big deal. was unheard of mm, yeah. in my community, in like the white neighborhood, right? Or whatever. And um, so the parents of the kids my age were like, you can't hang out with Lewis, you know, if his brother, you know, as long as he's in prison, you can't hang out with him. Mm. So I didn't really, I mean, I was already awkward and didn't have friends. And then that was like, oh, now I have less friends. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. It was like, no, he's a bad kid now. And so, um, what was the question? The athletic well, mask. Oh, yeah. This, the yeah, aggressive, aggressive mask. So for me, I took defense to everything. Like if anyone said anything to me, I was like, I need to defend myself. Building your protection. I need to defend shell. myself. Yeah. I need, and I need to fight back. Mm-hmm. And like, no one's going to talk bad about me. No one's going to make fun of me. Like, I'm going to, again, I'm going to get so big and strong that like, <clears throat> It doesn't matter. Like if I, I was just very like aggressive. I was, I was very loving because I just wanted friends. But then when it didn't go my way, I was like, okay, fuck you. you know? It's, it's yeah. almost like the masks that you talk about are just uh, unhealthy overexpressions of yeah. natural masculinity. Yeah. You know, like aggressiveness. Like we tend to be a little more aggressive, uh, which had its, you know, there's a reason for that. Yeah. But it's that unhealthy expression Absolutely. of it. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, some of the other masks, th- those are the main ones that I had, maybe alpha a little bit as well. I mean, I wore them all and I still wear them all from time to time. And so it's not like I've elevated to the mountaintops and I'm like aware right, now. Right. We never do, right? Right. I mean, you're always going to be working towards exactly. that. Exactly. But I'm very conscious of it when I am defensive. Even yesterday, I, well, uh, Matt, my COO, he, <laughs> Someone I felt very taken advantage of. And when someone, when I feel like someone's stealing money from me, it's even like a whole nother trigger for me. Cause I'm like, don't try to like take advantage of my name or, or, or my money. Yeah. And, um, and someone did both. Right. Yeah. Uh, I won't get into the details, but essentially I was just got very frustrated and I just started sending like nasty emails. And I was like, you need to do this now. Like, I've been very compassionate for the last couple months. You haven't responded. You haven't gotten back an answer of how you're going to make this right. So it's time you do it now. Otherwise, legal action taking place. And I was like, and this woman was like, well, I wish you'd be more compassionate and speak about like what you're doing in your book right now and continue this. I was like, I have been compassionate. And now I feel even more taken advantage of because you're not communicating. And Matt was like, I wish you wouldn't send these emails. He's like, I know it feels good for you. Mm-hmm. But it's not good because she could just screenshot. It we, wasn't like we, I was we swearing. Call that, we call that picking up the brick. It's like, don't pick up the brick. Yeah, exactly, right? Don't pick up the brick. I just want to be like, fuck you. But yeah, I'm like, yeah. okay. Now, when he was telling you that, were you defensive? Like, what are you talking about? I'm defending myself. No, because I'm like, I, saw it right, I, away. right when I posted, I go, fuck, I hope he doesn't see this. But he just CC'd it. So I'm like, I wanted to just say, hey, hey, I just posted this. I know what you're going to say. <laughs> yeah, yeah, here it comes. But just yeah. like, it's all good. Yeah, it's all I'm not going to reply again. I just need to get this out there. So it's still happening. <laughs> But I'm much more calm and like aware of it. Now, do you think there's anything mm. therapeutic about allowing those masks sometimes or situations? Absolutely. Like that? I think, the, you know, if we're angry, I don't think we should just be like, you know what? I'm just going to be loving and okay. I think we need to find our own mechanism that's healthy mm-hmm. as opposed to, well, I'm angry at this person, so I'm going to unleash it on them. Right. That's not healthy. Right, right. But talking about it with a friend or talking about it with my business partner and like communicating my anger and expression and that healthier context is healthy. Right. right. Sometimes it's warranted. Absolutely. You know, you're allowed to or, be angry. You know, I'm I'm all for having a, a room of like a punching bag room. Right. So like get your anger out as well. As opposed to, okay, I'm just gonna breathe and always bottle it up and never express myself. Right. And then when someone crosses me the wrong way, I'm gonna it's lose gonna come it on them. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. Which I've done as well. You know, and so for me it's like, okay, what are those things that are I think getting a pillow and screaming in a pillow is a great form of expression. <laughs> mm. You know what I mean? It's yeah. like good to let it out, right. mm-hmm. but find the context where it doesn't hurt other people and it doesn't hurt yourself. Right now, how did you when? How did you start identifying? Because the you know you use masks. Other people may say ego uh-huh. or you know this or insecurities. Yeah. How did you uh, first start identifying this? Uh, I started working with psychologists and just doing research. You know, I was like, okay, what are the characteristics that I have? What are the masks that I wear? Were you were you in therapy when you were younger? Never was in therapy. I've done a couple therapy sessions since I started kind of like diving in, since I started opening up about being sexually abused. Oh, this, I, that, I that's where a, I'm alluding yeah, to. four years ago, I started opening up about it um, because everything in my life, the reason this all happened is because everything in my life was working on the outside. I was making more money than I'd ever made in my life. I had, you know, hot girlfriends in my 20s. 
I had this, uh, you know, a girlfriend at the time who people were like, oh, she's super hot. So I was like, okay, cool. I'm cool. I right. made it. And I had a business. I had the athletic achievements. I had the awards. I had it all. Tom Brady formula. Right? People were like, exactly. And people were like, <laughs> you're crushing it. Like, everyone's like, you're crushing it, Lewis. It was four years ago. And I was like, well, why am I suffering? And I still, still empty still? Why do I still feel like it's not enough? Why do I still feel empty? Why do I still feel like, you know, I'm lonely all the time? I just felt constantly lonely. And then I started to, like, things just got really bad in my business partnership, in my relationship, with my health. Like, everything started going wrong. And I was like, why is everything else going right? And everyone looks, everyone says it looks good, but I feel like it's shitty. And I didn't understand until I, a lot of things happened where I got in a fight on a basketball court. Uh, I had to send a guy to get stitches from his face, and it was like blood all over the court to just like almost beating up my business partner in the middle oh. of Times Square. Wow, and this is after you've already <clears throat> have been successful. You you did yes. some shit like that. Absolutely. Wow. This is like when I was at the top of everything. Wow. Got in this fight. Ego is just like this massive at that yeah, point, right? so crazy, man. <laughs> I just I was, knocked someone's teeth I was in. So, like, I was so defensive towards everything. Like anytime someone looked at me in the weird way or said something to me that was like aggressive, mm-hmm. I had to defend myself, whether it be online or in person. It was like I had to defend myself at all costs. No, so you have such a great story with something like that. Do you, do you have things that you practice now where you, because obviously that has to resurface, right? There's yeah. got to be moments where you, 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 those triggers happen. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. It's funny. I mean, how much time do we have? We got all day, bro. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, it's funny. I'll give you an example. Three weeks ago, I'm going to uh, I'm going to the airport to get on a flight because I got to go somewhere right before this book launches. And the f- I get out of the car and I check my back pocket to check for my wallet and I don't have my wallet. So I'm freaking out, like checking the car. Where's my wallet? Where's my wallet? Realize I left it at home. And I've never lo- left my wallet back. So I'm thinking, fuck, like, what? how did this happen? How did I forget my wallet? This never happens to me. I'm like, you know what? I'm still going to make it on this plane because I f- always figure out a way. That's the way my mindset. I'm going to figure out a way. Is that self-belief? I was like, <laughs> there's always a way. Or delusion. <laughs> but I just believe, I'm like, I believe in the power of enrollment. Like, if there's something I want, I believe I will get it. Create it for yourself. Yeah. And so I was like, okay, door shuts in 15 minutes. I'm going to make it on, right? Because I always get there about 15 minutes before, like, the door uh, because I've got TSA pre-check. I know the line I'm going into. I know how fast it is. I've got one bag. Like, I don't have any water bottles in there. Like, I know what it's going to take to get through. And uh, I've done it so many times. So I get there and I go, okay, I don't have my ID. I have no identification. I need to get on this plane. I'm Lewis House. Yeah. They're like, <laughs> do you, they're like, <laughs> they're do you like, feel do you like have an asshole saying that when you do well, it? I was like, do, you, do you have any identification, I was on any bills, yeah. anything? I was like, mail. I was like, nothing. They're like, okay, you need to go over to this other line and talk to someone else. So I go over there. There's like 100 people in line trying to get through. I just go right to the front and I go, sorry, everybody. I got to get on this plane. I don't have my ID, this and this. They're like, we got to find someone else. They bring someone else around. They're like, do you have anything? I go, I have my book. I go like this. I go, I have my book. Does this work? It's got your face on it. Right? I, go, yeah, I, was like, I, was, I was like, here's social media. Here's all these things. Like, no, it doesn't work for us. It's like, fuck. Okay, well, what do we need to do? I need to get on this plane. Well, uh, we have to get someone else to do a phone call where they have to answer a bunch of questions you know, like on your background. I go, okay, let's do this now. I got 15 minutes. So they get, they take their time, their good old time. We go outside, we get on the phone call. I have to fill out a bunch of paperwork. I'm like, just do the call. Let's do this. I'm filling out paperwork. I answer the questions like my cat's first name, like my mom's maiden name, like my car from 10 years ago, oh, like addresses. <laughs> I have to verify everything. Finally get through like this first test. They're like, okay, we need to go do the screening. I'm like, cool. TSA pre-check, right? They're like, no, you got to go through the normal line now to like do the full screening. I'm like, okay, let's do this. But they get me through. They pretty much have to like strip me down naked. And the guy's like, okay, sir, I'm going to put my hands on the back like this, but I have to cover like your Dude, crotch. the way they do that now is yeah. crazy. It's like I have to go all the way Adam down and like feel experience. you. This just yeah. happened to me. Ever like, since he grew his like, beard. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah. And um, I'm like, okay, just grope me, strip me down naked. I was like, I got to go. I've got like three minutes now, right? This is whole process is done in like three. I'm checking my phone. I'm like, the door closes in three minutes. Let's go. Do whatever you need to. Like, tickle my balls. I don't care. Like, let's go. <laughs> yeah. And um, and they have to take every item out of my bag to swab each item and put it through the oh machine. And I'm like, guys, like, let's just do this as fast as we can, please. Shoes off everything. And they're groping me. They're taking stuff out. I'm like, can we hurry this? I'm trying to be calm because right. I don't want them to, like, frustrate. I'm like, 
it says I have two minutes now. Can you guys, is there any chance we can speed this up, please? You know, I'm trying to be nice. Yeah. And they're like, the gate is right here. Like, you're going to be fine. You're going to make it. This is what this woman said to me. I was like, ah, so that's the first time in my life I feel like I'm not going to make it. <laughs> By you saying that, it was like a bad sign. I go, okay, I'm trusting you. And she's like, you'll be fine. We get everything together. They're like, okay, you're done. I grab it all. I just start sprinting with like shoes in hand, bag, like clothes hanging out, running to the gate. Door closes right as I go around. Uh. I go, can you open the door? I got to get on. They go, sorry, once the door's closed, it's closed. I go, there's got to be a way. Can you open it up? Can you start a supervisor? You can unlock it. Can you do something? Can you call the pilot? Like, <laughs> I was like, anything. They're like, sorry, once it's closed, it's closed. It's policy. And now I'm talking to this customer support woman, looking at the plane through the window. People are still boarding the plane oh, okay. through the thing. It's still connected. I go, the plane is right there. It's not leaving. Can you just let me on? Yeah. And she's like, there's nothing we can do. I was like, and so at this moment, I am pissed at myself for forgetting my ID. Right. I'm pissed at the TSA pre-check people because they're like, threw me around everywhere. They took the good old time. I'm like, these people lied to me. They say they make it on here. I'm thinking all these things. I'm trying to blame everything else. And there is a trash can and a pillar holding up what it seemed to be like the entire airport right next to me. And all I wanted to do was punch through this pillar and break down the airport <laughs> and then kick this trash can and watch it explode in front of everyone's faces. And all I wanted to do was scream at this woman. I didn't do any of that. I just stared at the airplane and was like huffing and puffing. And the woman was like, sir, what would you like us to do? And I was like, if I say something right now and right. look at her, I'm probably going to regret what I say. And all of a sudden, the awareness pops in. I go, how funny is this that I am going somewhere to talk about my book about masculine vulnerability? <laughs> the irony. And all I want to do is punch someone yeah. in the face. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so I just start smiling to myself. And I go, okay, this can go one of two ways. I can walk out of here uh, humiliated and in handcuffs. Or I can walk out of here with my head high and let it go. Meant to be. And so I just like look to her and I start talking a little more calmly. And I'm like, okay, is there anything we can do for another flight tonight? She's like, sorry, there's no other flights. So I'm like, more lessons, more lessons, more lessons. Okay, okay. surrender to the process. And um, at the end of it, you know, I walk out of there calmly and not in handcuffs. You know what I mean? <laughs> I like, I, I, I get out of there and I'm like, okay, you know what? This was a lesson. This is a moment I get to take, be aware to. Like, sure, I could have handled it better. Um, but I still didn't break a wall down or something like I might have in the past. And so it's just being very mindful of these moments. And what I do now is in the morning, I actually think about all the things that I want to manifest that day and create. But I also think about like, what are all the things that could happen today with my triggers? You know, I'm in LA traffic. So if I drive today, I'm going to be triggered because someone's going to cut me off. Someone's going to be slow. Something's going to, mm. something's going to honk at me. Mm -hmm. It happens. My old way of being is like to always be right and to show that driver like you should never cut me off because I'm going to cut you back off now. And I'm going to always be a little bit ahead of you. Get you. Right? <laughs> yeah. And um, so I think about like what happens if my girlfriend says something that triggers me. In the morning, I'm like, okay, how do I want to respond? With defensiveness and anger or with love? And so I think about that in the morning. Meditation really helps me to just be mindful of like staying focused on two things. And this, what this book and this whole process has helped me with is realizing that there's two things that we should be uh, think about, thinking about at all times based on our actions and our reactions in any situation. And that is one, does my response support a purposeful vision for my life? If me responding right now and punching this wall, is that going to help me achieve my vision? for my business, my health, my relationships? No. And the second thing, does it support my inner peace? No. I call it desired outcome. That's what I tell people. Desired before outcome. You, before, yeah. you, before you say, open your mouth or do anything, think desired outcome. What's your true desired yeah. outcome from the situation? And when you really think that forward yeah. ahead, like what is punching or kicking the trash can going to yeah. get you? Nothing. Yeah. Never. It's not going to reach your desired outcome for and sure. And so does it support my vision and my inner peace? And if it doesn't, then... Be aware of that and don't do it. And I think that's helped me gain a lot of clarity on everything. Hmm. It's like, does, does saying yes to this commitment that someone asked me to do 
whatever, an interview or a meeting, does it support my inner peace and my vision or does it make me stressed out? So yeah. now when you have those moments, do you stop and breathe? Do you do Absolutely. something to yeah. No, yeah. I breathe. shut that off? I breathe and I don't respond until I've asked myself mm-hmm. that. Mm-hmm what's my reaction going to be? Is it going to help these two things? And like the sending this email yesterday didn't help my vision or my inner peace. It felt good in the moment right. to be like, right. Mm-hmm. But you know, if I really would like went there and like swore and did all these other things, like it could have been probably, you know, she could have screenshot that and put it online uh, and like said like Lewis is like a hypocrite and mm-hmm. isn't do what he says he does, you know, all these things like, you know, Again, it would have been more challenges down and, the line. And the irony is all the things that we do that we think protect us and shield us are actually the things that do the exact opposite. Absolutely. That's the whole irony of it. You know, Eckhart Tolle talks about the ego and learning how to become the observer. Mm-hmm. And it's the ego that reacts. And stopping and observing really makes a massive difference. But it's a practice. Yeah. Huge practice. It's well, a practice you got to do every day. I talk about it, you know, with friends and family. It's like exercising. It's like working out like... You're not going to work out once and all of a sudden become strong and fit. It's something you need to do every, every day. single day. And sometimes your workouts are better than others. Yeah. And it's, it just doesn't work where you just do it once and like, here I am. I'm you know evolved and I get it. It's something I got to practice every day. And looking at these uh, these moments like lessons, it's like looking at your workouts. You know, that's like, it, man. That's, well, that's absolutely let, it. Let's speculate a little bit. I, lo- I love when I have another really intelligent mind to add to this group and and someone who is self aware self aware as you are, and you also mentor a lot of young entrepreneurs that are mm-hmm. coming up. Where do you, what do you see with the generation coming up right now? What do you foresee the challenges they them dealing with with social media and everything going on? What do you what do you a see? A lot of it is the comparison mode mm-hmm. that I see with social media. Like everyone's comparing themselves to everyone else, especially in the fitness space. It's like, well, this person has more followers by doing this, so I needed to do this. This person looks a certain way, so I need to look a certain way. And what was the word you guys talked about? The uh, Intuitive? No, the anorexic thing. Oh, orthorexia. orthorexia. Yeah, and so mm-hmm. I feel like it's a lot of orthorexia for everything. It's like trying to be perfect in all these areas. And Do I you think, see it getting worse or better? Um, I see it getting worse first, and then people realizing yes. like this doesn't work. They have to go through their own lessons, unfortunately, mm-hmm. uh, unless people are so aware to be like, oh, okay, I'm going to hear someone else's story, whether it's mine or someone else's, and be like, oh, they had everything and it wasn't. It all, you know, I love the quote from, I think it's Jim, Jim Carrey where he's like, I hope, I hope everyone in the world becomes rich and famous and they realize it's yep. yeah. like not the key. How to funny happiness. is that? Guy goes off in the woods, does a bunch of mushrooms and comes back totally enlightened. Right? Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, I think, um, the challenge is people are driven to achieve and to, to make a lot of money and to be successful or whatever, but it doesn't bring the fulfillment. It just doesn't. I feel like a, a lot of the generation coming up to is in search of their, this purpose, right? They, they want to find this purpose. And when I hear a story like yours, I feel like there was so much heart, heartache, hard work, failures, things that had to happen for the success. And even when you had the success, it wasn't the success that you wanted. Mm-hmm. You know, can you elaborate a little bit on the importance that, of that and that whole process you feel? You know, it was all to prove my worth in the world. The achievements that I wanted to achieve were to show people like I was – valuable to be here in the world and to prove them that they were wrong about me. And it's just, it's negative fuel is the most powerful fuel in the world, but it will never last. It's not sustaining. Mm -hmm. Like I got to where I was based on negative fuel and I was so disciplined and committed. Like I would not say yes to go to parties. I didn't have a sip of alcohol in college because I was like, I'm going to prove everyone wrong. I'm going to be so disciplined and uh, achieve my goals to prove them wrong. And it worked. It got me great results on the outside, but I was like, man, I'm so empty still. And once I learned that, I said, okay, I'm shifting everything to not make people wrong, but to make others right and to not bring others down, but to lift others up. And that what I do, it needs to come from a place of inspiring myself and be an example for inspiration for other people. Mm. Otherwise, I don't want to do it because I did that for 25 years of my life and it was miserable. Mm-hmm. It got results, but I still wasn't fulfilled. Are, are there things that you've turned down recently like that that you people think- I turn down money all the time. Speaking gigs, business deals, opportunities that are big money paying opportunities all the time because it doesn't feel good to me. I'm like, I don't want to just make money as a transaction. 
unless it's something that I feel inspired by or something I feel like is going to help people or something that excites me. And when I do take those jobs and I'm like, okay, 50 grand for an hour speech, like something I don't really care about though. Like, sure. It's nice. And sometimes it's needed. Like if I'm poor, I'm going to take those jobs. Like, it's not like I'm not sure. going to do that. But if I have the option not to right now, I'm like, I'd rather put this energy and time into something more meaningful into my mission. What is that right now? What excites you right now? What are the things you like putting your energy into? I mean, my podcast excites me. I just like connecting with people in general. It's whether it's my podcast or this right now. I just love connecting and, and hearing stories and telling stories. Mm -hmm. uh, my mission right now is to serve 100 million people a week and to reach 100 million people a week to teach them how to uh, make a full-time income doing the thing they love the most. Because I believe when we make a full-time income, doing something that we are filled with joy and passion, we're going to treat ourselves better. We're going to treat our friends and family better. We're going to make better choices for our health. And uh, we're going to live happier lives. We're not going to be killing each other in the streets if we're doing something that we're inspired by. Mm -hmm. It's funny. As, as, as a personal trainer, you know, I, towards the end of – after I'd been doing this for so long, I realized – because you know, people would come to me and say – you know, I want to lose weight. Essentially, I want to lose weight so I can be happy. Mm -hmm. And eventually what I learned to teach them was, first you got to be happy. Yeah. And then you lose the weight in a real way. And, and you said you were always seeking the value or finding value. When did that happen? I need happen? to achieve and then I'll feel valuable. When did you finally yeah. realize that you are valuable? Um, when I started to heal the process of everything from my past. You know, I was four years ago, I started sharing with everyone the things that I didn't want anyone to know. Mm -hmm. Sexual abuse was just like the biggest thing, but just all my insecurities, all my fears, I started talking about them to my closest friends, my family. And then I was encouraged to talk about it more publicly, which I didn't want to at first. But then after many, many months of people saying, I think it's more of a responsibility for you to open up about this because your platform, I was like, okay, I'll do it. And the more I talked about these things, the less these things had control and ownership over me and the more I owned them. And it was like, I don't have to, I don't have to react or make decisions based out of this fear or this insecurity to like prove myself anymore. I'm like, everyone already knows my shit. Mm -hmm. Everyone knows like my mm -hmm. biggest fears and they're my biggest insecurities, the shit I've been through, like being molested, being all these things, feeling stupid. They know the worst of my worst. So freeing when you're there. And they all still like me and they all, they like they me even more. You. Yeah. They like for that. People were like, I've always judged you and now I've, I'll trust you. And I'll follow you anywhere. Isn't that I'm funny? Like, what? That yeah. was something I wanted Isn't to that Transparency. Man. I'm like, what? That was, that was like, something I wanted to Men were to like, you. you're my hero. Hmm. They're like, you're my hero. I've been married for 20 years. My wife doesn't know what happened to me still because I don't have the courage. How much of your hmm. life have you gone through? Because being a ta tall, good looking, athletic guy, white how, male, how yep. often do you get judged when you I walk mean, into a room? Instantly. Especially, I mean, it's challenging. And I get it because, especially with women, it's like, so many women have dated a tall, white, jock-looking guy at some point in their life and were probably had a bad experience with them. And so it's like instantly like, you're that guy. You're the guy who hurt me when I was 18, the guy that cheated on me, the guy that like broke my heart, the guy that whatever manipulated me. You're like the example. And so listen, I get that white male privilege is a thing. I get that I had certain opportunities that other guys didn't have. I get this. And just being a man, I had different privileges. I get this. But it also comes with a lot of judgment and a lot of, um, you know, just people constantly putting you in this like box, right? right? It's like, well, you're this way just because you look this way. Right. And that's just, that's just who you are. So it's constantly trying to break that mold. And part of this, you know, everything I try to do is to kind of try to break that mold. And this book is like very unexpected for a lot of people because there's not many tall, white, jock men opening up about vulnerability right, right. in general who are saying, yeah, this is what I've been through. This is my flaws. This is my challenges I've been mm -hmm. through, but they don't own me anymore. And I'm going to work on being better and I'm still not perfect and I still make some mistakes. So call me out on it when I do. Mm -hmm. Let me know. You know, it's that word privilege. I have a, when I hear it, it makes me upset and I'll tell you why. It's because... Who who determines what is privilege and what yeah. is isn't? For you, brother going to jail, dad, you know, almost dying, yeah. terrible, terrible things. But you could look at them, and you said that you look back at those as moments that drove you to what you're doing yeah. now and all your success. Absolutely. So it's almost like what we do with it can make it a Absolutely. privilege or make mm -hmm. it. 
Listen, I, I'm, I, I understand that, you know, being white, uh, there's a lot of like less prejudice, like walking down the street. I don't have to worry about a certain sure. things that some, another race might have to worry about. I get it. Um, but I think when it comes to women who are just like, well, you don't know what you're talking about. Like white male, I hear this all the time. Like, I'm not even going to like look at your book because you're just white male mm. privilege. They just automatically assume. And I'm like, <laughs> if you would, I see what you're writing about on Facebook about like equal opportunity, about vulnerability. If you read one paragraph, open up anywhere, I pretty much have copy and paste and say the same thing that you say. Yeah. So I'm, we're on the same page. I'm on the same side as you. I'm like, I'm speaking the same language. Right. Yeah, let's connect. Let's like, let's yeah, talk about is, it. Yeah. Like, I don't, you don't need to, whatever. I mean, you don't need to buy my book, but I'm saying the exact same thing that you're saying. I it's bet easy. that was a major yeah. disadvantage, but I also bet it's a major advantage for you. We talk about this with yeah. the three of us that people probably, uh, you're unassuming. You Absolutely. think that I'm going to get this oh, people dumb, think jockey, cocky exactly. guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And I'm like, oh shit, this guy's super empathetic, yeah. super friendly. And then I'm sure that totally wins people over once you finally get inside. Yeah, yeah. I mean, eventually. But people are still like, <laughs> people still are very strong minded to like, well, you look this way and so you're, and you talk a certain way. So you're just, you, this is who you are. The irony is the judgment on how you look and they're talking about don't judge people. Exactly. It's so funny to me. Yeah. yeah. There's a group, I mean, ironic. Like, I don't need to, like, harp on this or go too deep, but there's a group of, like, these, these women online who are just really negative towards me right now. Really aggressive, like, just saying a lot of nasty things about me in these private groups and now publicly, like, writing full articles about me. Wow. And they still won't even read, like, one paragraph. And I'm like, guys, you're, you're telling me that I'm all the things that are wrong about men and white male privilege, but I'm like, I'm here, like saying let's have a conversation like i want to talk and hear like tell me how i can be better tell me what i'm saying that is hurting you or hurting women or hurting this and they're not even they're like no i will never read anything you do i will never buy anything you do like because they hold on to something from the past of maybe why because you're talking about how well, masculinity has these masks and the difficulties yeah, exactly. and all that stuff how they're much like, energy as if there could, not, like there could be any difficulty here's, yeah. here's the thing yeah. it's funny i did an interview with marie forleo on her show this is so funny it's like do you guys know who she is? Yeah, I do. She's, she's yeah. got a pretty big female mm -hmm, audience, mm -hmm. like very, very influential. And so it was a great interview. And it's like probably 90% women who are watching and, and listening. And, you know, I'm just like talking, I'm opening up about everything. I'm opening up about my past. I'm opening up about like how, how men get to heal and like how men get to come together and help humanity and all these things, right? That like women are talking about as well. And then I say one thing that I say, you know what? Something about like, you know, I think this is a great opportunity for women to go through this. And at the end of every chapter, I talk about how women can understand the men in their lives and come from a compassionate place of like what they've been through from the past, just so they have an awareness. Without so realizing you just jumped on the right, third right. rail. <laughs> right, right. But I was like, you know, and have an awareness and be able to communicate to men in a way that they can hear it mm -hmm. and resonate with them so they don't feel defensive. And so this one woman was like, so you're telling women that we need to do the work. Men need to do the work, not women. And I'm oh like, and you're like, that's why you're wrong about everything. Because they were like, we shouldn't have to do any work with this. It's all about the men doing the work on themselves and being responsible. And I go, yes, I say all those things. But if you want to live with men and human beings, you get to understand them as it's well. It's like the playbook. I'm handing it to yeah. you. Come it's the keys to the kingdom. <laughs> yeah. So it's just challenging. It's like, it doesn't matter how much I'm like, you know, Equal rights for women, like don't hurt women, don't do anything. That, like it doesn't matter what I say. If I say one thing that's like a, that could be taken the wrong way, it's like a whole group of women are like, you're just this jock, white, mm. male privilege, mm. screw you. And I'm a, like, again, is that judgment? Where does it say about you? Exactly. What does it say yeah. about you? When you're that, attacking yeah. me, <laughs> isn't that what you say you're not yeah. supposed to do? There, there's a lot of uh, anger right now uh, surrounding these topics and it's 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 the result of a lot of different things from politics to you know po politicians put a lot of money in fostering and creating this divide to help you know get themselves voted in or whatever and you have social media that amplifies voices and so yeah. it makes things seem worse than they really mm -hmm. are when mm -hmm. the reality things are a lot better than they ever have been to the point where uh, you know if something does happen and get caught on camera the reason why it goes viral is because people find it a you know, disgusting. Mm -hmm. uh, otherwise, nobody would even pay attention. Um, but I think these are all good signs because yeah. when you see real change, right before you, start, you see real change, it tends to get Darkness. kind of this. Yeah, mm -hmm. you see super this, dark. This feverish, you know, like out, you know, uh, just people going crazy with things. 
before things really mm-hmm. start to change. But I think what people need to realize, and I say this all the time on the show, is people are inherently good. Most people mm-hmm. are inherently good. It's not the other way around. And if it was true that people were bad, society wouldn't succeed. You wouldn't be able to walk down the street without something happening to you. Yeah. The reality is most people are good. Most of us all want the same thing. We want to be loved. We want to be accepted. We want what's best for our children. And we want to feel fulfilled. doesn't matter if you're a man, woman, right. black, white. Yeah, gender not conforming doesn't matter. It doesn't even matter. Everybody kind of wants the same thing. And if we just listened, if we just listened and tried to understand or seek to understand before seeking to be understood. Yeah, or judgment or whatever. Yeah. Oh, I think we'll go so much further. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think a book like yours is, is, is perfect for that. So. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Excellent. Appreciate it. Appreciate excellent. It, yeah. Excellent. Thanks for coming dude. on the show, man. Yeah, yeah, dude. Yeah, you want to talk awesome. about how I got into podcasting yet? Yo, <laughs> we need to get there. That's <laughs> another show, dude. Yeah. Welcome to Mind Pump, bro. This yeah, is what yeah, happens. Yeah. We just start talking about some shit go all different directions. Yeah. <laughs> I, I would love to hear that story. You want to hear it? Yeah, 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 story. yeah, yeah, yeah. let's hear let's it. Um, so, to kind of get back to the original question. <laughs> the first question. <laughs> <laughs> to get back to the very first <laughs> question. <laughs> podcasting? Uh, I don't even remember. So, uh, so, after my business, you know, kind of... I got to a certain level with my business. I, I got in this fight with my business partner and I was like five years ago and um, in the middle of Times Square and I was like, okay, we just need to like figure out a way to like s- split this up and, and, and move on. And I was kind of over just like teaching about like LinkedIn and like Twitter and things like that. I was like, this is not really what I want to do anymore. It served a purpose to help me get off my sister's couch, make money and like not feel poor anymore, but it's not like my passion right now. So I sold it to him, and then for about a year, I just kind of was like evaluating what I wanted to do, and I realized like I just still love connecting with people and asking these stories. And I remember I'd moved to L.A. I was driving in L.A. traffic, and I was stuck one time trying to go like one mile. It took like an hour, and I was like, I'm so pissed off right now. This is like so frustrating. And everyone else around me was frustrated in their cars. And I was like, there's got to be a way to bring inspiration to people's lives when they feel like trapped in traffic or just stuck in life. And so I thought about like radio, okay, podcasting. And I called two buddies of mine who had a podcast at the time, Pat Flynn, who has Smart Passive Income podcast. And I called uh, Derek Halpern, who has a Social Triggers podcast. I called them both and go, tell me about this podcasting thing. Is it powerful? Is it helpful? Does it help your business? And both of them were like, it's our favorite thing to do. It has the most qualified leads we have for our business. People say, say unbelievable things about the feedback. It's amazing. And they love it. And I was like, oh, okay. These guys can do it. I think maybe I could do it. I had never listened to a podcast. And I told myself, I'm not going to listen to any. Because I'm going to create the thing that I'd want to listen to. Oh, cool. And not be influenced by like, oh, this is how they do their intro. And this is how sure. like, they do their ad sure. reader. This is how the, the music. I was just like, ah, I just don't even want to deal with that. I just want to like, what's the thing that would fire me up and that's me crazy it's a lot like us that's how exactly yeah. how we yeah. did it mm-hmm. and um, I called another buddy of mine in the same car ride and I was like I'm thinking about doing this podcasting thing like what do you think it should be and he was like why don't you do like a business show because everyone comes to you for business and marketing and I was like eh, it's just not what I feel I could want to do I was like yeah maybe I could be effective but it's not what I want to do I want it to be broader I want to be able to like interview like Olympic gold medalists and like billionaires and then spiritual leaders and like all these different people. And he was like, it's probably not going to do as well unless you like niche it down. God, that's what everybody thing. wanted us to do the same thing, dude. He was like, just do one niche, right? Not that he's wrong. I think I would have done well if I did like the business marketing show out of crushed. Of course. Right? Initially, but then it's yeah. hard to go out of that. Yeah, exactly. And I was like, and he's like, do it, you know, maybe do it like the Lewis Howes podcast. And I was like, eh. I was like, I'm not Joe Rogan. I was like, I'm not trying to do that thing. And I want it to be bigger than just me. And so I was like, what I really want to do, I started talking about it. I was like, what I really want to do is this, this, and this, and this. And I was like, God, I just wish, you know, these conversations that I get to have with all these friends of mine who are influential from every different industry, I was like, I wish people could hear these because it's unbelievable what they're saying to me and what I'm learning, but I'm the only one learning it. And um, I was like, I wish this is the stuff that I was been taught in school because it was so challenging for me. And everything was very hard, reading these textbooks and like just not understanding things. And I was like, this is the stuff that's helped me get to where I am in business and relationships. So I was like, I want to create a new school, like a school of something. And I was like, God, I just want to be fucking great. Like a school of greatness, <laughs> baby. And I was like, that's it. He was like, that's a great title. I was like, it school of great greatness. Title. And mm-hmm. it just like from that, you know, that frustrating moment created an opportunity, you know. 
my a weakness that I was facing created a strength. It was like make me think clear, get me out of the box. And so school of greatness happened. And then, yeah, almost five years ago, we launched it. And it, it kind of took off. Like, I remember saying to myself, I was like, I'm going to do this once a week for a year. See how it goes. And I'm not going to take any money. I'm not going to try to sell anything. I just want to do it because I'm excited about it. And I think that mentality really helped me because within like six months, the sponsors started coming and people were like, oh, I want to be on this and I want to promote, you know. And uh, I was like, oh, we have like a real thing here. When you first got going, and then of course you mentioned Joe Rogan obviously was kind of, he's like the Oprah of podcasting mm-hmm. right now. Who, other than Joe Rogan, like who are you kind of looking at? See, I know and you were doing your own thing, which yeah. is just like us, but were you watching others? I wasn't, what? I still wouldn't listen to anyone's. I, it wasn't until a couple of years after I was like, all right, let me listen to a few podcasts. And um, I watched a couple of Joe Rogan's, but I was like, man, these are so long. And like, Super long, super long, and it was like just some of the conversations were like, "I've yet to finish one. I've yeah, watched, I've watched like forty, and I've never finished one." But people love it. I know, oh, yeah. love it. They eat I it up. It. So yeah. it's all good. I mean, yeah. it works for people. Um, I was inspired by him, and then yeah, you know, I don't know. I'm, I'm always like watching the rankings and seeing what's happening, but I'm never like listening that much because I'm just creating so much, mm. you know, do you, when you look, when you look back or listen to your old episodes, how good do you think you were? I don't listen to any of them. Okay. <laughs> None of my episodes. Did you never, to. or did you stop at one point? Cause we listened to the beginning to a lot. Never listened to it. Oh wow. I actually, we critiqued ourselves. It's a funny lot. cause I went and I drove yesterday. I almost never drive anywhere, but I drove to see Rob Deerdeck's new show. Uh, and it was about an hour drive. And so on the drive back, I was like, uh, let me just check out like, Oprah's podcast because it was like the first thing up there. So I checked on Oprah and I actually listened to uh, Eckhart Tolle's thing. Oh, did about you? The ego and the, fantastic, yeah, yeah. right? It's fascinating. Um, and I listened to Shonda Rhimes and I was like, this woman's powerful as well. Um, so I listened to a couple of them and I was like, oh man, now I remember why it's so addictive, like listening to podcasts because I was like, oh, this yeah. is really powerful. <laughs> like yeah. I never listened to it myself. <laughs> but I was like, wow, I just like got through the whole drive an hour and listened to two episodes and I feel like mm-hmm. I learned so much and right. the time flew by. So I was like, yeah, now I know. <laughs> yeah. Um, what was the question? Did, then? did you, were you good? <laughs> oh yeah. And then my podcast, well, my podcast came on like right before, like it just auto played oh, okay. in the app. Right. And I was uh-huh. like turning it on to the, the, the car. And I was like, gosh, I just feel like I sound stupid. <laughs> <laughs> Even oh, no. like, this was like a couple months ago. We all think that. I, I was know. like, man, I just thought like, of it. I feel like I'm stuttering. I feel like I slur my words. I feel like I'm lazy and I'm like gosh I just hope I don't sound it I hope everyone doesn't think I sound this stupid <laughs> so I think part of it is like I just don't want to feel insecure about myself I don't know like what listening to it but but I think it's good also it's like game film you know it's it's good to yeah. wa- listen to or watch mm-hmm. um, I know I know we do a good episode when I'm listening to it and I'm listening to it like it's another show mm, when I get into show. it uh, if I'm sitting there critiquing it I know it's not that great of an episode. When I get into it and I start listening to it, and I go, oh, okay. We're in the flow. Yeah, yeah we were in the, yeah, flow. the flow. That was really good. Mm-hmm. I find cool. I find podcasts. Have, have you interviewed Stephen Cutler yet? Yeah, twice. Uh, oh, yeah. yeah. That's that's awesome. awesome. That's great. I find podcasting to be the most therapeutic thing I've ever done. It's like therapy. Listening or? Talking. Recording? Talking. Yeah. Talking on a podcast. It's very powerful. Extremely powerful. Being yeah, able to share good. Absolutely. our stories and whatever to all these you Yeah. Know, people or well, it's, whoever's a, it's there. amazing I mean and you keep talking to or alluding to it like I mean I always talk on the show that your true net worth is your net circle and we have this ability now with podcasting to meet all these other brilliant minds I mean I've grown more in the last three years than I did the previous 35 dude yeah it's, been, yeah. it's crazy how much we've it's grown like an incubator for right, when you're just meeting all these brilliant right. minds from different walks and uh, different I think it's just there's nothing else like it. There's nothing that I remember like being a kid that where right. I could I would have killed to have our podcast to have I reached know, out right? to. So yeah. when you talked about like the way you thought when you're creating, that's exactly how we created was, you know, what would we want if we were just getting into this industry, mm-hmm. fresh green trainers, don't know anything about health and fitness. What would need, yeah. yeah, what would what I need? What really works yeah. and what out there is bullshit. Right. Exactly. And that's what we addressed like first thing we had. How to long go you guys been that? doing it now? Three years? Three. Yeah. Three years. How many episodes you had? Oh, 600 600 and, yeah. 600 yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah, we go. We, go. Yeah. Play. Yeah. we like to talk. Yeah, I'm at 560, I think, right See, now. See, we passed yeah. you up already. <laughs> <laughs> the guy's He's competitive, gotta, man. Come pulling, on, calm down. I'm, I'm yeah. poking at your, yeah, your competitive mask. Hey, yeah, don't put the Wait, mask on. Who's got a higher rank? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> here's, your, here's your humble pie. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Let's add Rob's ear deck on. God damn yeah, it. yeah, we haven't had that. No. Yeah, no, it's been... It's What's been the biggest lesson you guys learned from... 
Oh my God, the biggest lesson? Having a podcast. Shit. Oh, you we know what? more about ourselves I, I can like, name, individually. I can, <laughs> I can name crazy. a couple. I can definitely name a couple. For us, this is a personal lesson for us as a group, was that we are our best when we're in our flow state. And the way we get in our flow state is we just go. Because in the beginning, we would try to kind of produce and, okay, here's yeah. what we're going to talk about. Or we would start the show by saying, hey, welcome back to Mind Pump or whatever. And just it going. just, it didn't, yeah. And when we didn't have the mics on and just the three of us would go, like nobody would shut up and it would be these great conversations. Yeah. And so that, that was the first lesson for us was our superpower is we can just go, let's just push that, which is why we do so many episodes. Well, especially with interviews too, because we weren't able to really get into that flow with other people. It was like, we had this flow and this chemistry, mm. but it's like, how do we bring them in? And we realized we had to cut this whole formulaic intro that we yes. would do with them. We're just like, no, psh, get rid of it, do it later. Yeah. And that totally helped. So yeah, yeah, that's yeah good. that was big. Mm-hmm. That's cool. That was a big game changer. I think that was one of the biggest game changers was the interviews. When we, when we first started, we did the first hundred episodes Pretty much just the three of us. Yeah, there was no interviews. Oh, really? It was just us talking about fitness. We had so much to talk about, and our backgrounds are so different in fitness that each guy had something to put, and we would openly debate things and topics mm. and read different studies that were coming out and then openly discuss them. And we had great conversation, and people loved it. And then we'd bring a guest on, and it would be our worst episode. Oh, and you were like, yeah. 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 So we're like, shit, do we not bring guests? Know, you know? And at that point, when you're first like, starting, they're not this. like, what's going on? Right. Yeah. We're, we're bringing like our friends, you know, yeah. that like have some cloud or something like that in there. We're not huge guests guests yet and so we know we were like man do we just do this by ourselves and and we're kind of going through the same thing you're talking about where you're like you know what we're not going to do a podcast just because everyone else does interviews maybe we'll never do interviews yeah and we went through a time where we're we were just doing just the three of us and said you know what like people are the feedback is they love hearing us talk we bring a guest on and it wasn't until and it took a year before mind pump reached a total of a million downloads and then we started mm. doing a million a month. So it really That's took great, yeah, man. it took a long time to get to the a million f- a month is big. Yeah, what are you guys now? What are you on now? So we're right we're right around there. So we one point two, one point five, depending. Man. Yeah. So it took it's hard once you kinda hit this like it's hard to keep growing. You hit the you, you mm-hmm. grow really fast, mm-hmm. and it's like you slow down, and it's almost kind of like flattens out. And you're like, how do I break through that? And that's like, kind of where we've been now. So a lot yeah, of the yeah. a, a, even like uh, you know getting uh, to interview you and going to drama next, and yep. we're really trying to branch out because when we named just like you did the school of greatness, we were like mind pump. We did not want to pigeonhole ourselves to just fitness. Uh-huh. You know, we wanted to talk about other yeah. topics, we wanted to, other people on the show. And so this last year or so, I'd say we really are starting to stretch that more and bran- yeah, branch out beyond yeah. just health. Because there's so many other things that we're into besides and, yeah, that. I, I'd say the other thing, the other big thing that we really learned was just being driven by our ultimate purpose. Which, And what I mean by that is there's times when we sit there and say, okay, we want to drive this part of the business or we want to reach this many people so we could do this many programs. And every time we do that, we're not our best. But when we sit down and really feel passionate about our purpose, which really our purpose for us is to help people, help yeah. people find their their health, their longevity, their fitness, growth. We're all growth-minded and growth-oriented. And when we go in with that purpose, everything else falls into place versus yeah. the – you know, strategic business. Yeah. You know, type we of also mentality. have we have massive egos, and we think we're going to actually. Change. <laughs> we actually believe we're going to change yeah. the fitness industry. Self belief is high. We, we believe yeah. that it's it's a big ship, but we think we're we're turning it. Yeah, it's, if you don't believe it, it's not going to happen. Right, yeah. and I, and I think each of us one hundred percent believe that we believe that we're making moves that direction. It's slowly happening. I think uh, the t- our timing of our message too. It's we're very transparent. We share our insecurities. We talk about all the stuff yeah. that drove us to working out and three meathead bodybuilder looking guys. No one was really saying that message. Yeah. You know, it's all around motivation and beast mode and no days off, and you know, it's it's the complete it's, opposite message. I feel like it's it's tough because I love saying like prove them wrong and all these like these little memes and these quotes. I love that shit too. It's like, of course, do whatever it takes, prove them wrong. Of right? course, it's like all that stuff, like Gary Vaynerchuk style and all these other people. And I'm like, yeah, I love that. I just want to do that, but then. It's not sustainable. No, it's yeah. not. It's freaking exhausting. It's, it's, what, it's what, a what tool. It, it's a tool. Well, what like it really is, is it's a spark. It's, and that's it's, about it. But it's he, not sustainable. No, it's no. not. Motivation mean, is bullshit. Self-belief yeah, is everything. Is bullshit. Yeah. And it's it's what's marketable. Because it's it gets so that good. instant dopamine rush. Light. You turn it on and you hit that mask. Yeah, let's go. <sighs> yes, and it hypes you up and it's that initial surge, but... 
it's short lived because yeah. it's artificial. It's not real. It's not intrinsic. It's not something that you feel compelled to do. Mm. It's somebody else motivated me, which it's no different than in fitness. And this is what we talk about when people come into wanting to get in shape. When you're driven by your insecurities, it'll only take you so far. Like if it mm, if that yeah. if that's what's driving you to take be, you pretty far, but not right. Hey, you know, work out uh, and eat right because you love yourself, not because you hate yourself. Yeah, and exactly. you, it'll take you. Not only will it take you far, but it'll take you forever, yeah. because that's a true feeling. That's one that we like. You, yeah. you can only hate yourself for so long. Yeah. At some yeah. point, you get sick of it, <laughs> and you jump off the you, you're, you're off the wagon or on the wagon or off the yeah. wagon. I hate myself, and now fuck that. I don't want to hate myself anymore, so I'm just going to give up. And then you create this false sense of. Loving yourself, where you're like, I don't care what I look like. I don't right. care. I I yeah. accept myself, which is just another false way of uh, you know of loving yourself. You're still yeah. hating well, yourself. and it's perpetuated by the people at the top right now in our space that are on the cover of a magazines that are and getting most perfect, perfect and shredded and yeah. jacked. And, and meanwhile, behind the scenes, they're the most dysfunctional, fucked up, out yeah. of balance people. You out know how there. I said earlier that it's got to get really bad before it gets good. Uh-huh. Social media is doing that. You have. At the moment, like uh, like girls in particular have been targeted by fashion and fitness and makeup, and you got to look a particular way with magazines. But it's gotten so much worse today because now you can go on Instagram and you can flip through a thousand pictures in an hour. And our primitive minds don't know that you're, you know, we, we, we compare ourselves to the things around us, and that ends up becoming the norm. And now we're super unattractive or we're not smart enough or not whatever and it makes us feel terrible and people are feeling so bad now that yeah. I think the tide is starting to turn. Mm-hmm. You're starting to see advertising campaigns actually try to capitalize on this where people are coming out and saying, here's what I look like when I'm relaxed and here's what I look like without Photoshop and they're trying to capitalize on it but it's a movement that's happening kind of on its own. We're grabbing onto it. We're yeah. pushing it, adding fuel to it because yeah. we know that the real path to long-term health, wellness, feeling good, whatever you want to call it, is in truly caring and loving yourself in the mm-hmm. truest sense. Absolutely. When you get to that point, the rest of it's easy. Absolutely. But mm-hmm. getting there is hard. I think the biggest challenge for this this generation coming up is going to be, you know, because there's the social media can be such a tool. I mean, you're a perfect example of someone who built this empire starting through LinkedIn, pivoting over in the direction that you did, is how do I use this as a tool and I don't become consumed with it? Absolutely. I mean, that to me is... Some days I'll be on Instagram for four hours and I'm like, what did I just do? Right. Yeah. Right. Where did my day what, go? What the hell That's I, how I know it's a big deal because I, de- I catch myself. Yeah. You know, I, a guy who didn't even have any social media just seven years ago. Mm. I mean, I catch myself getting sucked into it. I'm like, man, if this happens to me. It's addictive, man. Right. Yeah. The irony is got people who built their business through it were telling people. I know. To we justify it because it's <laughs> business related, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> how often do you meditate? If I was lying, I'd say daily, but I want to do it daily. <laughs> yeah. uh, there have been months. You know, I went to India last year for two weeks and did like a deep dive meditation all day long for two weeks. So after that, I was every single morning for like six months. And then I was like, man, I just feel so good. Maybe I don't need this as much. You know, I don't need it every day. Like, I'm, I'm good. Like, why should I keep doing this every single day? I can take a few days off or like I'm busy. And then it'd be like a few weeks off and I'm like, I go back to it. And I'm like, oh man, I start to feel a little stress again when I don't do it. So when I do do it, I'm like at my best. And it just keeps reminding me of like, okay, all I need is 12 to 15 minutes a day. And I feel when I do that consistently, it's like lifting. It's like mm-hmm. when you do it consistently, you're like, you stay strong. If you like take a week or two off, like I took two weeks off from doing pretty much any working out during my book launch. And I felt like it was total Started shit. All over. I just felt yeah. like crap. I was like, I stopped eating well when I was eating so good and I stopped training hard and I was just like, man, now I feel like crap. And so I got to pick it back up. Same thing with meditation though. It's mm-hmm. like when I take off too much, it's like... Notice it's totally noticeable. Right. No, I feel I feel the same way too. Sleep, everything. You know, I, looking at your your wall, I know it's impossible to ask you uh, who your My favorite person. I'm not going to ask that. What I'm going to ask like you, kids, as right? I know everybody yeah. asks yeah. that yeah. shit, right? Yeah. What I'm going to ask you is everybody. who surprised yes. you the most. Who surprised oh. you the most? Being a guy as self aware as you are and yeah. socially probably aware, you probably got all these guests coming in. Who came in? You're like, oh shit, like like Caesar Milan. Caesar Milan. Really? Caesar Milan. The dog was the dog guy. He surprised me because he was powerful about just like relationships and spirituality and other things. And I wasn't sure where it was going to go with him, but it was very Did he show insightful. up and go, shh. <laughs> <laughs> like right when you go to talk, shh. No, he didn't. But it was like, it was very powerful. I mean, talk about uh, insightful. He but was, he was. That's cool. More than just a reality star, I'll tell you that. Um, who that's else? That's great. 
tell you what, the one, um, Chris, Chris Voss, um, never split the difference. This guy is freaking really powerful. Do I have his book here? Mm. It was probably one of the top 15 episodes I've done. What's his book about? I don't know. The name's called from- Never Split the Difference. He was the lead FBI, um, Ooh. uh, ne- negotiator for like hostage situations. Oh shit. So he talks about like when someone is crazy and giving you demands, how to like navigate that situation when something's on the line. You know, he talks about that, but he applies it to like, okay, when you're doing a real estate deal, when you're like getting a new client, <clears throat> how do you negotiate? Oh, interesting. It's very fascinating. He was powerful. Um, they were all, I mean, they're all amazing. So. Yeah. When you look at the wall, that's why I said I didn't ask you your favorite. But Rob because- Deerdeck, obviously for me, he was actually one of the most powerful as well because you think of like a skateboard MTV like host, but this guy is brilliant. Mm-hmm. I mean, mm-hmm. he is fucking unbelievable. And have uh, you followed him for as long back? I mean, I've followed I've him for since, 10, you know, 10 years. I've been following since Robin big. Yeah. You know, like you said, for me, it's why you have two bulldogs, right? Right. I was watching him back in college, you know, and I was just like, this guy has the life. Like it was, and he was from Ohio. So I was like, <laughs> I was even more connected to him because I'm from Ohio. So I really resonate with what he's built and his mind is and the And the way he's done it, all the things. His mind in. is fascinating. Yeah. He is very diligent and disciplined and with every area of his life. He tracks every area of his life with a system that he built for himself, tailored to his needs. And it's just mind-blowing. Super unassuming. So unassuming. And just a brilliant branding mind, design mind, like Mm -hmm. just very creative. He's got his hands in so much stuff. He seems like he's very humble. And here's the thing. I watched him do a show. He's got a new show called Awesomeness. And so I was like, I wanted to go watch and support him. So I went and watched Drama, who you'll see tomorrow, and and Rob. I'm talking to them before in the green room. We're hanging out backstage or whatever. And then I go, and it's like a full-on set. There's probably, I don't know, a couple hundred people in the audience, like in a circle. Cameras everywhere. It's just a lot of moving parts. There's a panel of people. There's teleprompters. There's people clapping. There's lights. There's like different acts happening for the show. And he has got to be, I understand what it's like, you know, reading from a teleprompter and like managing all this other stuff that's happening. And you've got to be like so focused and in the zone to like read these takes because people are there like clapping and trying to hit everything on the mark. And it's just like, it's a lot to navigate. Yeah. And the reason why I believe he's successful is because he allows himself to play and have fun through it all. Mm. On set, he's doing exactly what he did in Robin Big. He's like singing songs and he's like reading something. He's reading it as a song, like prepping for it. He's talking to the crowd. He's like just goofing around and playing. Super and like, charismatic. He's loving it. He's just like trying, he's being himself and I, that's why he delivers. Yeah. Like when he was like, he gets in the zone and he's got to read the prompt and he's like, fuck, okay, I'm going to do this in one take. <laughs> but he's just like playing around to keep himself loose. Yeah. And not just like trying to be all professional or whatever. He's like, he is himself at all times. And I think that's why he crushes it because he can go into a boardroom with executives, wear a ball cap, and he just like is himself still. Yeah. I think people resonate with that and mm-hmm. it comes off on camera too. So so we're, we are going to be with uh, Drama tomorrow and yeah. you know them. So what, do you, what should I get him talking about? You should talk about drama's experience from like Ohio growing, or I think he grew up in Ohio as well. But yeah, talk about drama um, growing up, and if he thought he'd be doing this like fashion brand, and yeah, I'm really interested in the story of while Robin Biggs happening. Where is he at in his life? Is he watching? Yeah. Is he watching Rob? What's he thinking about? He was like the assistant or whatever, right? For Robin Big, he was like, oh, so he was already he, he was in the show. Hmm. Oh, he was. Yeah, he was in what? the show. I don't even he remember. became like a yeah, sidekick in yeah, every episode, dude. Yeah. yeah, no, he was. John was in the I show. Was right. like, oh, I'm bringing in my cousin to like help oh, out, and he made shit. him like right. pick up dog shit and do this. Yes, and, you're right. So he was like the little bitch that <laughs> he had to clean up after the mini. That's horse right. Really. He did. Yeah. He did. He brought him in with like the third or fourth season. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. yeah. I think it was only around a couple of seasons. It went four. Two, three, did it no, go four? I thought it went four. I have them all. Mm-hmm. I own them all. Maybe. Maybe you're right. Um, it's funny because I went on his show the day after Big Black died. Oh, mm. wow. It was like the day before that happened. And it was like, so it was an interesting episode. I, I didn't even really share much. I just asked him questions all the time about how he went through that. Yeah, how was experience. he? Yeah. yeah. Um, so I would talk about that. I mean, his brand is like evolving so much. And yeah, just talk about his vision. Mm. Yeah. What's right. your what, what's your dream moving forward? Um, <clears throat> 100 million in a again, week. Again, I want to reach 100 million <laughs> every week. But I want to be, I don't need to be like the guy or the expert or any of these things. 
but I want to be the, the facilitator of everyone. Mm. So I want to facilitate conversations and be the curator of greatness mm. where it's like, I have my own show. I get to interview the biggest people in the world and talk about the ideas, the stories, the products, the, the things that are happening and curate and facilitate this and make it about other people. Not necessarily about me, but be the center curator of it. So that's the goal. Excellent. Yeah. You're on your way, man. Yeah, 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 yeah. for sure. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah. definitely. Yeah. Well, thanks for coming on. Yeah, I appreciate yeah, you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Great time. We will absolutely, we'll absolutely do this combo. again for sure. Yeah, yeah for I'll sure. Have to come up to San Jose next yeah, time. Yeah, man. Yep, come check us out. Yeah, we'd love Excellent. it. Excellent. All right, so go to mindpumpmedia.com, enroll in our 30 days of coaching. It's available for free. Also, check us out on YouTube, Mind Pump TV. There's a new video every single day. Thank you for listening to Mind Pump. If your goal is to build and shape your body, dramatically improve your health and energy, and maximize your overall performance, check out our discounted RGB Super Bundle at mindpumpmedia.com. The RGB Super Bundle includes MAPS Anabolic, MAPS Performance, and MAPS Aesthetic. Nine months of phased expert exercise programming designed by Sal, Adam, and Justin to systematically transform the way your body looks, feels, and performs. With detailed workout blueprints and over 200 videos, the RGB Super Bundle is like having Sal, Adam, and Justin as your own personal trainers, but at a fraction of the price. The RGB Super Bundle has a full 30-day money-back guarantee, and you can get it now, plus other valuable free resources at mindpumpmedia.com. If you enjoy this show, please share the love by leaving us a five-star rating and review on iTunes and by introducing Mind Pump to your friends and family. We thank you for your support, and until next time, this is Mind Pump.